Good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with O.B. Kaufman. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the Marketing and Events Coordinator here at Copperfield's Books and will also be your host for the evening. Copperfield's Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together since our founding in 1981. I'm thrilled to remind everyone that all nine of our stores are currently open for both inside service and curbside pickup. And as many of you can attest to, COVID-19 has been extremely tough on small businesses, in particular indie bookstores like us. So I'd like to take a moment at the beginning and thank all of you. The support of you, know, you guys buying books from these events is allowing us to continue to provide them free. So I'm, you know, we're all very appreciative of that. And a piece of good news, this weekend is uh, the encore of our renowned warehouse sale. So if you didn't make it last weekend, head down there this weekend. Okay, so just a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce the author. We will be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, links to purchase tonight's title, as well as a 10% discount code for use on our website. I'll include links to previous works by Obi Kaufman and will also include my contact details for post-event information. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to tonight with any comments or questions for the speaker. The format will feature around 45 minutes of conversation and then will be followed by a live Q&A. And I know it'll be a great discussion, so we'll definitely leave time. Um, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. Please submit your questions here. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's author, Obi Kaufman. Obi is an American naturalist, writer, and illustrator. Growing up in the East Bay, Obi spent most of high school practicing calculus and breaking away on weekends to scramble around Mount Diablo and map its creeks, oak forests, and sage mazes. Into adulthood, he would regularly journey into the mountains, spending more summer nights without a roof than with one. When he is not backpacking, you can find the painter poet at his desk in Oakland, posting at Coyote Thunder and trail paintings on social media. His website is coyoteandthunder.com. So Opie is one of our very favorites here at Copperfields and we've been so excited about this event. Um, it's the first major, uh, it's the first book of a major new trilogy and he's here with us tonight to discuss the forests of California. So we're really stoked to see and hear what you've been up to during this time. Why don't you take it away? <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much. So we're going to have a little Q&A at the end. Is that what I understand? Yes. Is that okay? okay? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes, I'd hope so. In fact, I wish it was I wish it was mostly Q&A, you know, Copperfields. You know, we can do that. This is your hour, Obi. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, me, let me walk you through, let me walk your audience and this community through a uh, introduction to my work, where it's going, where it has been, and uh, what, I've, what I'm thinking now. Um, I, I have a relationship with the Copperfields community that goes back uh, at least three years. I've been I've been uh, a customer of Copperfields for many more, but I've been one of your one of your authors for three years since the California Field Atlas has come out, right? So uh, um, I have a particular affection for your community, and this being like this virtual uh, book tour that I'm on, that does you know I get to go to all nine locations at once. So that's a nice and special thing. You know. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, indeed. All right. So uh, I will, I, I've already begun this presentation of mine. Let me, let me, let me, uh, let me give you some artwork here. For those of you who don't know me, I am um, an East Bay kid. My name is Obi Kaufman, and I am, as Jamie uh, <laughs> uh, told you, I am the son of two scientists. I and very sensitive to what science is. And I am approaching it as an artist and it's gonna take my whole life to do that. I published a book three years ago called The California Field Atlas. I followed that up a year later with a book called The State of Water, Understanding California's Most Precious Resource. And my new book is The Forests of California. It is the first of three books continuing this invented genre of mine really although it's a genre that exists in exactly one data set so it's like you know 
is it really a short ride? <laughs> I probably uh, will leave that to uh, to others to decide. I um, have invented this thing called the field atlas, which is much different than a field guide, for example. A field guide will walk you through what things are. A field atlas will tell you how things work, or at least that's the aim and that's tr the trajectory. Uh, for the past, um, Seven and a half months I have been dreading uh, November, as you all have, but I've been taking the time to uh, <laughs> been taking the time to deal with 2020 day by day like the rest of us, but also thinking about what it is to be a steward of California. Actually, let's even take it back a step and say what it is to be from California, finally. When do we stop being immigrants to this place and, and start being from here? Start taking responsibility for it. I've been had a chance to do a lot of reading. In fact, I, I believe that uh, for every every hour I spend reading, I want to, I mean, for every hour I spend writing, I spend an hour reading. I spend an hour walking too. And I've got to paint too. So, I, you know, you can quickly see how my days are swallowed <laughs> in, in uh, the idea of making one book after the next. I am so thrilled at the reception that this work has uh, garnered this modicum of success that this work has achieved. And when I was touring these books up and down the state, from San Diego to Crescent City, from Tahoe to Fresno, all points in between, I am consistently amazed with how wrong the hype is. When we are together in a room, and I tell you, um, I wish that I was with you all tonight. I would, I, I like to ask my audience, for example, like, how many of you have seen me before? How many of you are scientists? How many of you are creative professionals? How many of you in, are engaged in stewardship? How many of you were, and here's the one where I imagine that 95% of you in the North Bay will raise your hand. How many of you were directly impacted by the fires over the past five years? Uh, I know tonight that I am talking to that community in particular, and so I'm going to walk uh, gingerly and with great care through uh, this subject matter, which is intrinsically tied to how we see the state and how we see our future in the state, how we see our future residency, how we see the human ecology interfacing with the more than human ecology. Um, we live in a very special place and I am constantly amazed at how let me see, where can I put this right here? You're all seeing my little windows bounce around. I'm constantly amazed at this world-class portfolio of biodiversity that we have the miracle to live in the same time with. That is the California floristic province. It's just 4% of the land area that is North America. And yet we've got over a third of all the vascular plants, all of the vertebrate animals, and many of them are endemic, meaning that they don't exist anywhere else on the planet besides us. And now, of course, we're in this time of great transformation and reset, which I think, gosh, you know, sitting here respecting the shelter in place order from my home in Oakland, California, uh, writing the next book, having just written this book on water and this book on forests. And then it turns out that, gosh, in the last 10 weeks alone, check out this statistic, in the last 10 weeks alone, one third of the total land area in California that has burned over the past 100 years has burned, has burned in the last 10 weeks, uh, which is Cal Fire statistic. You, know, you, you can see that, you can see that little pie chart up there in the, in the upper right there. 
And you can see that uh, well over uh, three quarters, nearly seven eighths of it, of the fire has burned here in the past 10 years. Now I'm not going to bore you with another lecture on fire ecology. I think that uh, 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 you all being in the North Bay have heard so much, right, about how and why this is happening and you're all balancing in your own heads what a climate fire is, what a feral fire is, what good fire is to bad fire, what the urban wild land interface is, and do I want, what is my relationship to this perilous place, right? Am I from here? Like, never, never before have we had the opportunity to be so involved with exactly the environment as it comes into our lungs, as it comes into our daily lives on a very personal, very intimate, very sense-based level. We, are, we, are, we feel the fires in our bodies. And where do we go with that? What does that mean? What is that next? Well, I posit in my books being all about the nature of hope. I go on and on about what hope is, not hope as a thing of like, you know, I hope it's going to rain. That kind of hope is generally useless. I'm talking about hope as an actionable tool. What is the plan? Well, as I was saying before, touring this book up and, and during these books up and down the state and really engaging with this activated community and rejecting the hype that we get sold day in and day out, including from you know, whatever vice presidential or presidential candidates seem to be barking at each other. We here in California may be, may be able to see past that polarization. Maybe what, what, what is it finally when we burn so much that we recognize other things be, besides political agendas? How do we divorce that? That, that? that would be another book. These books are maybe a heading towards that. I would like that. I would like to start with a discussion of what is real and what is true and where meaning comes from. What is the nature of nature? And uh, so I invented this field atlas to devise exactly to, to explore the character of California that I wanted to tell. The character I wanted to tell. What has always been here, or at least since what, the middle Miocene when California began to resemble its current tectonic configuration, when the when the California current came down from Alaska off the Eastern Pacific there to deliver us what would become this normalized pattern of Mediterranean-ish climate that only occurs in a half dozen places around the globe. Of course, buffeted against then to the Sierra Nevada, which began its long, slow rise 200 million years ago, well before California was any sort of, it resembled itself at all as we would know it blocking itself out often from the rest of the botanical province of North America and creating this excellent island, if you will, as it's been called by many ecologists over the past century, where speciation, the product of making species, clicked in with a particular kind of um, mechanical eloquence to create all of these endemic species, species from flora and fauna that uh, exist nowhere else and that still exists today. So that which has always existed, that's which continues to exist to this day. And that's that miracle that I'm talking about that we exist in right now because of all of our, all of our natural landscape types, all of our endemic habitat systems are either threatened or endangered usually both, but our extinction rate is exceedingly low. 
less than 1%. No, it's less than 1%. Less. It's very dangerous for scientists or ecologists to actually declare something extinct because declaring something extinct means there is no time. And if there's no time, then there is no hope. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm always circling back to this idea of hope and fleshing out what that means on a philosophical level, on a deep level, on something that you can use, you know, and there's that temporal aspect of hope. Like, if there is time, there is hope. And I love thinking about time. What has always been in California, what continues to be, what has always been like, check out that, that blue line there, that Yuba River in the middle map there, which is the um, three forks of the Yuba River. So it comes down one of these ladder, I, I think of it as a ladder up the Sierra Nevada, these, these east to west flowing rivers that, have, that be, really began carving their water course and, and building their watershed five, six, eight million years ago. In fact, the Yuba River has been flowing into the Pacific Ocean or finally making its way to the Pacific Ocean before California was even recognizable as itself. That water, when you touch the Yuba River, any of those Sierra Rivers, that water is very old water. Or at least that's a poetic way of thinking about it. I don't make road maps. I don't make a road atlas. You know, I don't even look at that map. I'm not even telling you where anything is. What I'm telling you is about how the river flows, the shape of the river. I'm, nothing is important but the shape of that river. Okay. There's no roads around it. You know, that river will be that shape long after all of this excellent concrete, plastic, and metal that we've so successfully imposed as a veneer across California's topography. All of that will have long since, long since returned to the dust from which it is made before that river looks any different. Depending on how much water flows through there is another thing. That, and that's getting to what will always be, right? What has always been, what continues to be, and what will always be, despite all of that stuff that I described, that urban jacket. Um, what what will always continue to be and that you know that that check out that map there on the right okay so that map on the right is then projecting into the future another six eight ten million years really that's ten million years looking out when the i when the peninsula of baja becomes the island of baja and follows that san andreas conveyor all the way north to then ultimately become a suburb of what will be then the archipelago of san francisco so I imagine a time when the California floristic province is still a thing, but this enormous island has occurred because Sierra Nevada aren't going anywhere. Uh, when the biosphere itself is recovering from what we have instigated, the sixth mass extinction on the globe, the biosphere is recovering from that and inventing all of these new iterations of what might already be here. Think of, think of the crows, <laughs> think of the ravens, think of the coyote. Gosh, you know, think of the tiny little mammals. They're still going to do it, you know, just like they did it 65 million years ago at the end of, at the, end of the, you know, the fifth mass, ex mass extinction. You know, nothing survived that was really bigger than a bread box. And, uh, and that all became all of that great cornucopia that is the mammal portfolio. Uh, you know, so yeah, I like to think about time a lot. Will placental mammals, as they are today, as some sort of like dominant creature like we are, you know, will will those kind of mammals still be the order of the day? Who's to say? You know, that but but we do know that big beautiful island will be completely replete with a whole massive forest of some kind of life that is that is searching for its own homeostasis, searching for its own equilibrium, much as our forests are searching for it now, as if they've forgotten it over the past 150 years, as if we've robbed them of that memory. So I, 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 made, I made the California Field Atlas, and then I, I knew I wanted to make a book on forests, but I couldn't get my head around water. So I made this other book, and uh, really, this book was published on a dare. Uh, my publisher, Steve Wasserman, down at Heyday Books, and I 
I, I told him, I, yeah, I, so I have to figure out water. Like, I, you know, I thought it was going to be an essay. And he's like, no, let's make it a book. And uh, I said, okay, there's plenty of, to talk about, but I have to be very specific in the voice that I am coming from, right? Like the only way this is going to make sense is if I'm just being true to me, being true to my audience and just saying like, I'm trying to figure this out too. So I focused it on three things, right? Which is, which is storage, which is uh, conveyance and which is usage. Like, okay, so, we've, so what I know is that what we've done with water from many perspectives, the single most altered aspect of our natural topography. What we've done with water, really in the past 90 years, rivals anything. I mean, it's so complete, excuse me, so complete with its like totality of transformation across how it is, uh, it affects it affects all moving water in California down every fraud, fresh water system on some level. Humans are there. Humans are are manipulating it. We have altered the natural topography of our waterscape more than any other aspect of that topography. And what we've done in the past ninety years rivals anything that humans have done with anything at any place with any stuff material substance that is water getting it from point a to point b for our own services is uh remarkable now it's 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 my contention again going back to the field of time both in the past and the future that that great accomplishment will be only rivaled in all of human history again by how it again transforms over the next 90 years and this gets into a larger point that I can talk about all day long. And, and this, this presentation is not that. This is just an introduction to my work. Uh, at the end of this whole uh, presentation tonight, I will, I will give you my email address and I will, I will leave you with some thoughts. As I say these things though, um, I would like you to think about uh, a question that you can ask me. And if you, if I don't get around to it tonight with this conversation with Copperfield Books, uh, you can email it to me. Like I, I'm really like collecting letters and, and I'm really enjoying um, uh, reaching out. We all need to reach out. I mean, that gets back to what I was talking about earlier, like this idea, like I'm here on this virtual book tour with y'all and I can't see you. I don't get that magic. Like, let that magic that special something that special something when humans are in a room together you know we get this we get this communication thing and then we start telling each other stories and then we start changing each other's minds instead of making arguments because all we've got is conversation my friends all we've got is conversation well that's not true we've got two things conversation and violence i prefer that we stick with conversation we've got a lot of things to talk about and we need to work this out and something like this grand, gosh, we, Yellow New Fire is now the first giga fire in California history. It's a million acres, folks. That's a new era. That, I don't care how you got here. You were here with us now. It's like the end of arguments. So what are we talking about? What is the story that we're telling? I'll tell you a good story. Um, this is the adaptive cycle. This isn't my invention. Invention. This is a, this is a, Hypothesis, a lot of uh, my work is rooted in that idea of the hypothesis, which is the idea that um, I've got these ideas that I think are true, that I feel are true, but I'm going to leave it to tomorrow's scientists to, to really come up with the experiments that turn this stuff into theory. Uh, I wish that my work had more methodology towards that. I wish that my philosophy could be science. And I think that science is a big enough basket to hold all of philosophy. In fact, philosophy is driven to become science at this point. And I will give science, physical science in particular, the ability to find and to penetrate objective truth like nothing humans have ever conceived before. And I will give, I will give that to science. 
we're still working on personal truths and political truths. Okay, so that's Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's not me. I've been listening to a lot of Neil deGrasse Tyson's Neil deGrasse Tyson lately. I love that guy. Uh, my dad was a lot like him. Okay, so my dad was an astrophysicist. He wrote astronomy textbooks. I, I hear even like in DeGrasse Tyson's like cadence of voice, my dad's voice, which is which is endearing to me. I, I grew up studying. Dr. Kaufman's son was going to be a mathematician. It's like, well, dad, you know, now I'm a painter and writing big sprawling books on nature. So I hope somewhere, you know, you know dad, dad's alive in me right now. It's just, this is the next, this is the next uh, phase in the intellectual legacy, I hope. Uh, he used the cosmos as his metaphor for the inquiry, the penetration into natural truth. And I am using this consilient theory of where the humanities and the sciences meet to tell a better story, not to make a better argument. And the idea that fire is a natural process in the forest is a best represented in my mind, in my poetic language as a wheel. All living systems go through that. What can you extrapolate for that? I'm not exactly sure yet. I have a lot of ideas about the nature of mind inside forest. Like what is the actual mechanism? Is it conscious? Is it sentient even? I've felt that. I've felt that when, when I'm wondering about the mycorrhiza in the soil. I'm wondering about the excellent distribution of species in a habitat space where the individual moments of scale in biology begin to challenge my notions of what is the object and what is the subject. I think of how I use that word mycorrhizal, the living soil. It turns out about 30 to 40% of the top 10 centimeters of soil across the globe is alive with microscopic creatures. Most of them are fungal in nature. Connecting one thing to the other. And the way that fungus works, or even specifically lichen works, with the fungal biont and the algal biont, these two creatures to form one creature, in a way that transcends specific, specific taxonomic biology, or at least it seems to. We're beginning to break down when we study how many different forms of life, and these are the oldest forms of life. Fungus got the earth ready for terrestrial plants when plants finally emerged from the sea. Okay, well, there was already fungus here. There was already a mycorrhizal mat, as it's called, this spongy living soil. You pick up a handful of soil in a healthy forest, and there are more living entities in that handful of soil than there are people on the planet. Seven billion. Like, where do you begin with that? You know, I, you know, I, I, I realize I threw on some biological terms there, but, but where we begin with that is recognizing on an ecological level that what we do not know dwarfs what we do know. And that is such an exciting thought. I mean, I think again of Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about dark matter. There seems to be that all of this stuff on literally underneath our feet that makes the forest go. You know, I'm, I'm driven to like talk like, <laughs> you know, it's like you know, childish mechanistic terms. Like what makes the forest go? Well, it's the mycorrhizal. It's the right mycorrhizal network. Anyway, it is such a fun time to be a student of ecology. <clears throat> now, as a student of ecology, I am a student of ethics because I can be, okay? Because that's where the arts come in, right? Because I'm not a research scientist. I am figuring this out for myself and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm asking you to trust me to do that, right? And so I've got a few, I've got a few licenses. I've got a few shields that I'm able to employ rhetorically, philosophically, where I'm giving you these books, not as textbooks, okay? So like, again, my dad wrote the, wrote the astronomy textbook. 
you know, he, um, Dr. William Coffin III, if you want to see like universe, black holes and warp space time, the general theory of relativity. That, those were his books. And there's no, like, I have his PhD doctorate over there. It's just like 65 pages of nothing but math. Like it's called three, prob three problems in astrophysics. I just, it's the most beautiful poetic thing. I just have no idea what it says. Um, what, how I approach this as an artist is that I won't leave you alone with that information. I'm not gonna hand you my dissertation with all those numbers in there and say, yeah, see, I, I learned something, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm involved with the synthesis as opposed to the analysis, right? So I get very uncomfortable. I got some community colleges down South and stuff, but like wanna like maybe use my books for, for, for textbooks and such and such class. And it's like, yeah, you know, it, 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 I am not, I don't want this on that sort of like in that academic space because this is popular literature, right? This is a book of my paintings with all of this data-driven art, hundreds of hand-painted maps of how nature works around the state, but it's all very subjective, right? Because it's from my mind. It's from my, it's, it's from my perspective. It's with my bias. It's with my privilege. You know, I was listening to Jamie read my bio tonight and she was like, yeah, he lived more more uh, more nights without a roof than with one. Yeah, but that was me exercising my privilege, you know, especially living here now in downtown Oakland and, and feeling just on every level that all of this stuff, all of this stuff that we're responsible for and that we're doing is about the nature of justice and working for justice in the morning and working for justice in the evening is the only way that I will get a good sleep at night all justice is connected like all the boats are tied together and if and, you know environmental justice equals racial justice equals justice equals justice this is the way of harmony like uh, one day after i'm done writing nature books i'm gonna have to write what justice is you know right now i'm balancing that idea be between rights and responsibilities right which is like how do we live up to american ideals Cartography, what has always been, what continues to be, and what shall always be. Uh, that felt good to say. <laughs> Whenever I talk about justice, and then I got to go back exactly to to what we're talking about with the 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 homeostasis that we're. Uh, longing for the 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 how achievable is it or isn't it uh, there are three PDFs that are available right now that read to me like poetry and I, I wish that I could print out these three PDFs on some sort of magic paper <laughs> and, and, and give them to every one of you and everyone in California because everyone needs to be on board with this. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. Uh, it's almost like, hey, welcome to California. Here are the three PDFs. The three PDFs are the first one. Uh, the first one is getting to neutral. The plan for negative emissions in California by 2045. Okay. There's a plan. <laughs> it was just published in August. Like we can still do that. The decisions that we make over the next two decades will affect the character of the entire biosphere over the next several centuries. And it, all of these problems, all of these stressors that the biosphere is experiencing right now, from climate breakdown to the simplification, degradation, infirmity, fragmentation of our the arboreal habitat of California, all of this stuff is intentional stuff. It came out of our intention. And it's with that intention that we can put it back. And there are steps, right? And we, and, we, and we look to our scientists. We look to our scientists to give us the very best data. That's all we need from scientists, you know? We can leave it to our journalists. We can leave it to our artists, which I, which I you know, humbly suggest 
or that's a hat that I like to wear, you know, in this ring. Wait, you throw a hat into a ring, but you wear hats. I don't know. Mixing my metaphors here, mixing my colloquialisms. Okay, so that's the first PDF, getting to neutral. You can find these links on my website, coyoteandthunder.com. I just posted them yesterday because I've just been reading them and I put them together as a little trio. The second, the second one is the carbon forest plan of 2018. Okay, so 2018, that seems like a million years ago, huh? Well, it's not. This, these fires, even the disastrousness that was 2020 fire season, that is 2020 fire season. My goodness, today was a hot one. Well, you know, curl up with a good book this weekend because I don't know if we're going to have much electricity. And that's okay with me. <laughs> Carbon Forest Plan, Department of Energy. We now have not inept leadership, in my opinion, in Sacramento. Okay, so uh, there are many environmentalists with whom <laughs> I have many intimate relationships. I love them. I'm one of them. Maybe I was one of them. I'd like to think of myself as a post-environmentalist because everyone's welcome. Remember, the age of argument is done. Now is the age of justice. <laughs> uh, the environmentalists out there say that, uh, you know, left isn't left enough. You know, I, you hear that political argument, but again, that, I think that's a really simplistic, terrible way of framing things. And, and it's so, it's so, it so, feels so 20th century. You know, we've got a new plan coming forward, and this is science-based. We're talking about corridor ecology. We're talking about applying ecological thought to the way that we protect and designate uh, land management across the state um, in a way that we never have done before. We are learning so much about the decisions that we made in the 20th century, and many of them were terrible. But we just didn't have the knowledge, and it's important for us to not hate on that history either. Science is always changing, you know? Gifford Pinchot, the first director of the Forest Service back in 19, what, 10, 12, something like that even a little bit later, he learned forestry, this very new science of forestry in Europe. And he really thought, he really thought it was good science to say, if we can suppress fire in the West just enough, and this was on the back of the 1910 Big Burn. The 1910 Big Burn happened through Idaho and Montana when 3 million acres burned in 36 hours. And this was because, largely because uh, the rail, the, the old uh, locomotives were coming through and just, just sparks were going <laughs> into the forest. And at that point, you already have uh, um, the end of indigenous anthropogenic fire regimes, normalized fire regimes across the West. And that was the first like big mega fire. And that was the, that was the beginning of the er era of, or at least one key chapter in the era of fire suppression policy. And it was based on bad science too. Not, not only was, I mean, I talked about the end of indigenous uh, anthropogenic fire regimes, but, but it, I, I think that there can be no doubt that fire policy was Fire suppression policy was also wrapped up in a manner uh, manner of colonial violence that we're still getting over. I don't I don't hear that too much. That fire suppression is colonial violence, and that gets me to my third PDF, which is the Karuk Nation adaptation, the Karuk Nation climate adaptation plan. Okay, so this is an excellent, you know, 160 page, uh, in depth. Uh, uh, paper written by biologists um, within the tribe, and the tribe is up there in the, in the Klamath River Basin. And it seems to me like an excellent uh, inroad into the idea of community climate sovereignty, which is something going forward that uh, is fascinating. The idea of 
uh, bioregional economies. The uh, the idea of maybe 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 it's deeper than just cars. Maybe it's deeper than just plastic. Maybe it's not about. And here's one for you. Maybe it's not about the linear economy at all. Maybe it is about a circular economy. And what I mean by that, the linear economy, right? Very simply, let's just put it in really simple terms. The linear economy is, 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 is excavating resources from the earth, turning them into things and disposing of those things. A, B, C. That's how GDP, that's how the gross domestic product is created. And that's how that's how that's that's our idea of wealth in this, you know, what's been called late stage capitalism, you know, but what about the round economy where nothing is actually thrown away? Can we imagine? I think we can. And how we and how we start to imagine that is by absolutely and fundamentally changing our idea of value. And I'm not talking about uh, arguing for this. I think that it's happening. And it, nothing that I, I like, I like to just plant this seed in your head. <laughs> and I'm telling this story. I'm telling this story because I'm telling the story to my great granddaughter's granddaughter. You know, like I want her to know an intact, the intact portfolio of biodiversity that I got to experience. So I start the forest of California with the idea the forest of California presumes that the intrinsic value of biodiversity outweighs the capital value of its dismantlement. That is, that's like key to understanding my position in this. Am I, am I running late, Jamie? I see, I see you turned your video back on. Hello. Yeah. You know, of course, everyone is just enamored with your work, but we do have quite a few questions. And I is it time to start hitting the questions? Okay. You know, Sounds good. Yeah, if, if you don't mind, we can, we do have the option of going until 8.15, but, um, you know, I just want to make sure to have enough time to get to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would love to get to everyone, too. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my talk from value then, then goes towards this idea of optimism, right? Very different than idealism, you know? We, we are in the bottleneck now, and we have no choice but to confront these truths and to face them with optimism. So you got the hope, you got the justice, and you got the optimism. And these are the things that are going to pull us through this bottleneck. And that's philosophy, that's not science. That's like, we take the science and then we build that out of that. With that being said, Jamie, hit me with a question. Let's, let's, have, let's talk. No, nope, you're still muted. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's definitely chat. Um, you know, there's also lots of feedback as well. And I just want to start with a, a comment from Barb. She says, this is incredible. Such a big, huge topic, how to live and appreciate the wonder where we live and to understand our impact on what we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, having a hard time coming up with a question, but I just wanted to start it with that. Oh, thank you. That, that's, that's very good. Uh, reaction, right? Uh, call and response. Yes, please. Bring it on. Thank you so much for your comment. So Nick is wondering, can you tell us a little bit about your research process? Yeah. My snake is falling down. There we go. Um, yeah, my research process, uh, for sure. Like, uh, you know, I start, you know, you crack open the California field, Alice, and at 550 pages, there's several hundred hand painted maps of, of how nature works around the state, pretty much divided and organized by earth, air, fire, and water. And, um, and uh, not a ton of uh, sites and sources in the back, because uh, a lot of that is, 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 is me just creatively interacting with the topography, right? You can see so, met, so much of that da those data-driven maps, though. You can see them like at, uh, you know, good old uh, 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 scientific websites, for example, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, United States Geological Survey, USFS, Department of Energy, these kinds of things. They're usually about, you know, 13 or 15 clicks in, and they're low res, and those maps are not for you. Those maps are for other people in the field, the so-called experts, right? So I was thinking about this idea of like re, 
or like reverse design, re reverse engineering the site from the computer back to the book, you know, this, in, this, this impeccable like um, interface, right? That, uh, that uh, is able to make sense of these deeper maps and, and present them in a way that is for you, that is for the citizenry, right? An informed citizenry is the greatest tool we have for developing political will. And political will must be uh, derived from consensus. How about consensus on even what reality is, right? So this is me trying to figure out reality. So I'm, I'm sitting there looking at a map of uh, San Gorgonio Peaks, for example, you know, the California, uh, Southern California's tallest peak there north of Palm Springs. And I'm in the San Bernardino National Forest, and I'm, I'm looking. I'm like, actually, there's like ten peaks here, you know. And I've hiked that place, and there, and it's it's kind of hard to tell which one is San Gorgonio. It's like, what is that? Uh, and then it, and so I made a map called the Ten Peaks of San Gorgonio. So this is this sort of creative interaction with the subject. Now, I've sort of abandoned because because 550 pages should be enough to go through that kind of exercise, right? Um, and then my next book, The Forest of California, well, after The State of Water, but after, you know, State of Water, I got really used to sort of like this journalist hat. There's the hat metaphor again, you know, this, this idea of like researching, right? And having lots and lots of endnotes and footnotes. In The Forest, I, in, you know, I really love taking on these big contentious issues, right? You know, forests, water, like all of this stuff that people really know a lot about. I know that going into, I, I, there, there's half of, there's half of, uh, there's half of your audience out there tonight that knows more about mycorrhiza than I do, that knows more about um, water resources distribution than I do, that knows more about policy than I do, right? So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grand generalist in that way. And what I really attempted to do with the Forest California, with over 75 pages of notes, right? Sites, sources, you know, where, ex like, if I say something that's like, wait, what was that? No, like, it better have a footnote on it. You know, like, I didn't say that, you know. Uh, all of my philosophy and stuff, that stuff that those licenses and those shields that I'm talking about that I employ as an artist, when I talk about my presumptions about the value of biodiversity outweighing the capital value of its dismantlement, that kind of stuff, that can be researched and presented and has been presented in, um, you know, by researchers who are, who are, who are more qualified than I, you know. I'm, I'm, I, but, but, but they don't, they aren't coupled with uh, my handwriting and my pretty pictures of butterflies and moths. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, so, so it's, it's all about this particular story that I want to tell this engaging with my own affection for the land itself. You know, that's the first line of the California field atlas is that this is a love story. The first line of the forest of California is that this is a family album. So it's like this, this, maturation this evolution of my own affection for this place despite its perilousness its beauty endures so that's that's a quick introduction to my research what's the next question there jamie yeah um i think your passion is something that makes it so watchable listenable it really mm. it brings a new edge to the topic so thank you um all right, we have you know a couple other questions about your research, but I'm gonna leave those for you know maybe read the book and I'm sure you explain in there. Um, Obi, can you talk about how you approach the painting of animals for your books? Do you observe from life and or base it on photos? And can you share what art supplies you use? Yeah, totally. Here's my paint. <laughs> Look, presentation from home. Um, watercolor, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm a backpacker. That's, 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 that is, uh, you know, <laughs> that's how I came into this world. And that's how I'll go out. How about that? Um, no, I, I, I love lightweight stuff. And I don't, you know, sometimes I don't even like carry paint. It's, maybe it's just uh, coffee or wine. Those, those make good paints too. It's all about the brush and about the quality of the paper. So uh, do you take pictures uh, then of animals and then recreate them or? Yeah, lots of pictures, lots of pictures of animals. Right, right. The general rule of thumb is that, um, is that if it's very small, like a flower, or if it's very big, like a mountain, it's probably from life. You know, I like to just sit there and I can paint a flower 10 times in a morning and I think I like one painting, you know, and the rest never see the light of day. 
or they become kindling that night. Oh. Um, but if it's if it's a mountain lion, <laughs> you know, uh, they make terrible models, as it turns out. So I'm gonna just paint a picture, and and that is that's how I. I think there's I think there's something that happens that a photograph doesn't capture when 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 you see a painting of it. There's something that you recognize from the you know from from your hands, like the the human the human media applied paint is goes back to what anthropologists call the cognitive revolution, right? A hundred thousand years ago when we were inventing visual art, when we were inventing the idea of fiction at all, when we were inventing the idea of story, right? Like that, it's, it's very powerful to me to experience this like aesthetic arrest, you know, that's, that's, that's what aesthetic theory will, will call it. You know, uh, James Joyce, for example, talked about that a lot in Portrait of an Artist when he was like, the experience of aesthetic arrest the human mind is so powerful that the experience of atonement is uh, sublimated. When the eye of the universe perceives the thing of the universe and the two are made one, like it's, it's a very strange thing that I can just paint a few lines in a field of color and your mind puts together all of that chaos in a with a very sophisticated cultural lexicon within this within this uh, cultural time frame that we have right in this common set of languages that transcends me talking me making an argument and it brings us together in a way and that resembles to my mind a new sort of semiotics a new sort of signifier between the artist and the viewer and the community that is a very powerful tool and i wonder you know again like I, I think about connectivity not only between habitat spaces but members of my own species like how do we talk about the beauty of a thing the beauty the beautiful experience of the forest well here's a painting and that and that and it says you know it says the thousand words that i'm looking for Awesome. Um, I well, just... thank you, Jamie. Yeah, yeah, you know that felt that felt good to articulate right now. Talking about, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, aesthetic theory as applied Honestly, to the I field feel of like ecology. I need to go take my fish oil or something because, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, you just reminded me I need some supplements. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to just, Christine just messaged in and she said, thank you so much for booking Mr. Kaufman. He is one of the most exciting, thought provoking and engaging authors, speakers I've ever heard. I'm a huge new fan. Thanks, Christine. Oh my gosh, that's that's so <laughs> terrific to hear. I'm so humbled to hear things like that. You know, like I would hope that um, this idea of geographic literacy, this idea of field atlas, is so, sometimes I get like requests like, when are you gonna do the field atlas of Oregon? Or when are you gonna do the field atlas of New Mexico? It's like, I, I can't, you know, like, like I, I, I know this place, I'm gonna do three more books after this. I've got the coasts of California coming out next year. I've got the deserts of California coming out in the fall of 2022. And then I've got the state of fire, how, where, and why California burns coming out the fall of 2023. And then I'm going to go on a walking book tour for a year. Hopefully by 2024, we'll be uh, back in each other's company. And uh, oh my gosh, we're going to be talking about the next president. Um, <laughs> oh God, not the next one. This keeps happening. Yeah, it keeps happening. Anyway, I'm going to walk all of 2024. And if you would like to join me, I'm taking on uh, expert backpackers, you know, you got to carry your own stuff and you got to know what that means. But I will be walking from April to April and, and going all over the state looking for uh, you, you all, you know. So, like, um, if you want to join me, my email is coyoteandthunder at gmail.com. And again, I'm not promising any sort of timely response, but just let me know. And then, you know, as the time gets closer and I start developing my itinerary and like where I'm going to be and that kind of thing, I'll. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put you in the mix. 
That's so awesome. And I just uh, shared the, his email in the chat box. So grab that there. Um, you know, we received quite a few questions about soil. Mm. Uh, are you planning to cover soil in any of your, your upcoming series or? Yeah. You know, soil is, is, uh, a component that is, um, worth it, you know, earth, right? I don't have exactly the temperament for it. You know, I really like the vertebrates. <laughs> I really like the animals. I used to be a big wildflower guy, you know, and, uh, and uh, gosh, I really love the trees too. But, but these days I'm really into the ecosystems and that's like, where like, you know, it's just like a passion for me is I love the thought of mycorrhiza, mycorrhizal, the, you know, the, the thought of that intensity of that, like, the, the, the quantity of life down there. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, I've got lots of friends who are mushroom hunters, for example, and like, you know, talking about mushrooms with a mushroom hunter is like, you know, just like, whoa, <laughs> you know, like, like, it's like, okay, all right. I love, I love you because know, mushroom people are so excited about what they do. Um, I am, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I have this thing in me from when I was young you know, I learned how to backpack in the eighties back in Big Sur. And, uh, and when I was a young man, I felt acutely like nature was something that I had missed. I mean, there were no condors, there were no whales, there were no otter, there were no elk. And it was just like, you know, and now all of those species are back because of good policy, good science, good love, good passion, working for justice, hope, and optimism. You know, like it's all still here. We have to tend the miracle. We have to steward the miracle that we find ourselves in, and it's going to take everything. Yes. So you know, yeah, you don't you don't have like a choice anymore to be like like huh. Like, I guess we're just like, you know, I guess it's too far gone. It's like, no, get up, get to work. This is going to, you know, it doesn't matter who wins in January. How about that? Or who's sitting in the White House in January, I mean to say. It, it, if, it, it, you know, if it's the one guy or it's the other guy, we're going to still get up every morning and work for justice. Because those two guys, you think one's going to save you from the other? We got to save ourselves and we're Californians. Let's get together and let's do it. Let's do it. Um, all right, so kind of a specific question. Um, Deborah is wondering if you have any recommendations for restoration of three acres from Tubbs Fire with Winter Creek. Um, all but one oak and scrub oak remain. They want birds, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Oh my gosh, that is just such a fun project. Yeah. There are so many better resources than me. You know, I'm such like a guy who studies like California at scale, you know, I mean, there are, I, you know, I love going on walks, for example, with the California Native Plant Society, which is a fantastic resource in itself, you know, or I'm thinking, I'm thinking the Sonoma Land Trust too, you know, I mean, there's so many great resources out there. Um, whenever I go on a hike with CMPS, there's always like, I don't know if if you've ever had the pleasure, Jamie, but there is always, and I don't mean to be in any way, but like funny and, and, and cute with this comment, but there's always like the little old lady, you know, who's like in her 70s can hike circles around me and speaks like perfect botanical Latin, you know, it's like, oh God, what a treasure, you know, just like, you know, and they're all over the state too. It's not like, it's, it's like a particular, I don't know, it's a thing in the air, but, uh, yeah. but uh, to all, to all you botanical ladies out there, you know, or, you know, I know, I know there's some men among you too, but they're, they're, that they're, they're just always just such my heroes, you know, I just put them up there with like, just high, such high regard, you know, right up there with like firefighters and stuff, you know, who've just like committed to this like place in a way that like, I wish that I could. Oh, um, I'm getting, what's kind of, we got a few minutes left, huh? Anybody yeah, else have any questions? There's a lot of questions and I'm trying oh. to decide what is most, you know, relatable for everyone. Oh, um, I see. okay. So a couple people, anonymous attendees are, you know, they say they, they feel guilty when they drive to, and then recreationally enjoy wild places. How can they deal with their guilt? Oh man. What a beautiful question. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's not about anything, but your relationship to yourself, like 
guilt, right? Um, in fact, I think that you should say that that is not, that's like, like, take it easy for a second. You know, like, in fact, I say like, the story that you're telling yourself, like, the big story is that I'm going to this place to connect with this place. And I love this place. And that's fine if you use your car to get there. At this point, that's what we do. I have a Subaru. My next car is going to be an electric car. Everybody's next car is going to be an electric car. Just do that. <laughs> anyway, um, um, at this point, this is, this is what we do. Like, that's changing. The story that I would, I, we're all asking ourselves right now, my gosh, in this time of pandemic, in this time of fire, in this time of what, what is going on right now? We're, we, we are in a moment of transformation and reset, just like the forest itself though, right? We're burning down our own little forest. And uh, the, the myth, the myth that everybody needs to go to work every day to some office has been blown wide open in the past eight months, right? Everybody's working from home now all of a sudden. Oh, so that was just a thing? That was just a thing that everybody suddenly changed on a dime? And we're not like, you know, like that, huh. So what other transformations can we make in our society? What other stories are we telling ourselves? Maybe it's not the best story that I have to spend 12 hours a day driving two hours to this place, looking at a computer for eight hours, driving two hours back, not seeing my family at all, to be this thing called a good citizen, or even at worst, or at best a good citizen, at worst, a good consumer of things, right? Like we're telling, we can begin to tell ourselves a different story. And that is, that is, and that story involves you forgiving yourself for going to the river. In fact, you have to go to the river. Go to the river, take your shoes off, put your feet in the water and ground yourself because whatever happens, especially next month, whatever happens, we're gonna need you grounded, we're gonna need you centered, we're gonna need you unpanicked. Because this that is a long answer. <laughs> okay, thank you, right Sorry. on. No, that was amazing. Um, okay. So uh, let's go with one last question here before we wrap up. And it's you know also one we've gotten from many people. Why did you pick the picture of the snake behind you? Uh, <laughs> would you prefer a heron? <laughs> 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 I, you know, uh, what else do I got here? How about a, you want a hawk? <laughs> hey, that hawk looks cool. Thank you, right on. Oh, here's, here's a new one that's a bristlecone pine. Right? So I mean, those are just laying around behind you, huh? Yeah, I'm just pulling stacks of paintings. You know, I mean, here's one of the, um, this, is, this is up by Trinidad Head up there in uh, Trinity County. Um, yeah, Trinidad State Beach, that was a while ago. That was a beautiful day. Looks you know. Cool. Thank you, yes, indeed, yeah, right on. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's the kind of stuff you can see me every day posting at, on Instagram, I like that platform above the rest of them. Um, at Coyote Thunder is my handle. Please, uh, please um, go there and uh, you know tag Copperfields. Yes, tag Copperfields. So thank you so much uh, for being here with us and taking the time to to show us what you've been working on. It's really inspirational and just powerful and moving. Um, we've received so many comments thanking us and, and thanking you and, you know, how much motivation people now have. So that's. Well, thank you, Jamie. I really pre appreciate being here. You know, I posted on my Instagram today a map of all of the fires in the North Bay across Napa and Sonoma County specifically. I was hoping uh, you were going to show that. Oh, it right. oh, so, well, right. we posted it so, gotta, so now you got to go to my Instagram to see it. And that's just fine, right? Go to my, go to Instagram. Like Copperfields has it on their Instagram too. So go there and check it out. And you can see that. Copperfields, which I believe is the largest chain of, of bookstores in Northern California. Thank goodness for you guys. You know, thank goodness for you as like this stalwart network of independent booksellers across the state. You're doing what you're doing. You believe in this excellent technology, the book. It's such a beautiful thing. People need books. I, I think lately that 
that uh, that a book is a trail to the mind that 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 it is like the book is a, a the analogy or the equivocalness the equivocal experience of a hike as your eyes traverse miles of printed words over the landscape of your imagination that is brought out by there i um, am deeply indebted to the work that copperfields does and it is such a pleasure to have uh, presented my work here tonight and i really thank everybody listening for uh you know keeping up the good fight as best they can and please and please you know keep keep a stubborn optimistic idea of how beautiful this future can be and how we can best steward this miracle that we're living inside of right now so great and right uh, on jamie so great and for all of you on this uh, who attended i will be sending a follow-up email it will include all of his links his hashtag where to buy the book the discount code and a link to watch this again on youtube so you can uh you know re-watch and revisit look at the pictures again um, thank you so much, Obi. This is thank you, Jamie. I'll see you in about a year for the coasts of California. Hopefully. That'll be out this time next year. Hopefully, and thanks to all you who attended. It's the best time of the day for me. So great. We'll see you tomorrow. All right. Bye. Good night.